I've been a green for many years. Uh, when I was in high school uh, in uh, the late 1980s, I had some friends uh, who started an environmental club. Uh, we called it, we were very serious, we called it Student, in, in, let's see, it was called Student Environmental Intervention for a Green Earth. <laughs> Sounds like a high school group. What, are the, what is that acronym? <laughs> siege, right? Earth is under siege. Yeah, we're, we're Gen Xers, right? So it's, it's our mentality. The world's dark, we're gonna fight it, you know. Uh, but uh, they decided that they, uh, some of my friends said, hey, we should connect with these guys at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the UW Greens. And so we went to one of their uh, campus parties one night, and I'd never been to a college party before, and uh, I, it stuck, <laughs> just say, it stuck. You know, I've been a member of the Green Movement and the Green Party uh, since about 1990. And so I've had a rare opportunity to see the Greens uh, go through lots of different twists and turns and sometimes to be there with the party. Uh, I have been there as, uh, as David Cobb uh, sometimes says when the first time we met was at the founding meeting of the Association of State Green Parties in Virginia in 1996. He said his memory of me was of me holding my head in my hands <laughs> uh, the entire time through the meeting because I came from a part of the party that was very much devoted towards uh, the unity of various Greens across the country. Uh, I met Howie Hawkins at that meeting too. He was shut out, the door was locked on him. Uh, now David and Howie are good friends and, um, and we've been able to achieve that unity, right? But I've had the opportunity to sort of be a skeptic looking at some of the internal divisions that happen with a party and to decide, do I want to devote myself to this? Uh, I ran for office as a young candidate, uh, 20, 21 years old, uh, ran for Dane County Board in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, in a very close race, uh, six vote margin, 49.8% of the vote, uh, and we had a recount, and it was an interesting process. Um, I've worked on many campaigns as a volunteer, uh, and uh, you know, literally over 100 local races in Madison and other parts of Wisconsin, many of which we've won. We actually have a winning uh, record of running local candidates in Madison. Uh, most of our candidates win their elections. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work on the staff of the Nader campaign in 2000, the Midwest field director, working to get on the ballot and dealing with um, uh, conditions which, unless you were there, you could only imagine. I mean, we had our offices broken into, computers stolen, volunteers beaten up, volunteers arrested for petitioning on July 4th in Indiana. You know, uh, it was a very intense uh, insurgency. Um, I served as co-chair of the National Party for several years and then uh, I sort of came out of retirement more recently to, to run Jill's campaign. So I only say that mainly to give you a sense that I'm not kidding when I say that I had the opportunity to have a lot of private conversations with lots of people and see many things. And my view of the Green Party in the United States is that over the course of our 35 year history, if you want to look at it as, as coming up on that, you know, coming out of the late 1970s into the early 1990s, the 1980s was the origins of the party, we've had periods of great growth and we've had periods of coming back. And the Green Party today in the United States is in a period of growth. I would argue that the period from 2004 to 2008 was our most difficult time uh, uh, in, in my memory. Uh, but we have a period of growth, and I think there are some key reasons for that. Uh, some of them have to do with who is in power right now in Washington, D.C. Whether we like it or not, periods in which the Democratic Party is in power tend to be better for Green Party growth. Why? Because people can't forget that it's the Democrats who are delivering austerity and attacks on civil liberties and who are violating the Constitution because they are in power, right? Whatever you may think of them personally. So the late 1990s was a period of great growth from the Green, for the Green Party. Clinton did more to build the case for the Greens uh, than, uh, than George Bush senior or junior ever could have done. That's one reason. There are some things, I guess, what, what I'm trying to say that are beyond our control that have an impact on how much we grow. And so this is a moment of growth for us. It's going to continue to be for a number of years at least. So let's make the most of it, right? There's another reason why I think we're moving into a period which is, um, uh, presents lots of opportunities. And unfortunately, it's not, a, uh, it's not the happiest reason. It's that we were right. We were right. When we talk about the Green Party, sometimes we talk with voters and with people on the street and in our communities about the fact that we're a values-based party, that we have these things we call the 10 key values of the Green Party and the Green mo Movement. And some of those come off our tongues 
readily, nonviolence, grassroots democracy, feminism, social justice, but others we don't talk about quite as often. What are some other key values for the Green Party? Diversity. Diversity. Other. Well, it is a key value, but I'd say it stems from, uh, how about the 10 key values? Yeah. How about future focus? Future focus is a key value of the Green Party. We have always been a future focused party. We have always been a party that is looking down, not just to the impact of the policies of today for the next generation, but for the seventh generation. We look out for future generations. We look to see what are the crises that are coming and how can we act in a preventative way. And so the Greens in Germany and in Kenya and in New Zealand, I think those are the three countries that really rightfully have the claim to have been the earliest Green movements that became politicized. Um, and also here in the U.S. have always been future focused and looking ahead to the future, to the issues of the future that were emerging in their time. And certainly nuclear holocaust was one of them. And Greens, to their credit in Germany, have had a pivotal role to play in the denuclearization of that country. Whatever our disagreements may be with them on other questions, that is a pretty significant accomplishment. Um, climate, the climate crisis has long been at the forefront of the Green Party internationally. And just for anybody who may not know, the Greens are organized in over 100 countries and on every continent in the world today. We are a truly global political party that shares pretty much the same agenda, right? There are some, again, this is a big world. <laughs> but when you get down to it, Greens have common values and a common agenda. And just as a footnote, we did win Antarctica in 2000, just so that <laughs> those American scientists who were voting uh, from Antarctica did vote for Nader Leduc in, in 2000. <laughs> maybe they knew, they, maybe they saw some things that were happening around them that they were studying. But because we've been future focused, um, we not only get to say that we were right when we talked about the dangers of endless war and the dangers of climate catastrophe, and we talked about the problem of the growing corporate dominance of not only elections, but our entire society. We not only get to say that because, and, and you know, saying that doesn't do us much good, people don't like to be told, we were right, you should have listened to us, na 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 That doesn't help you at, at, at a polling place, in my experience. But more importantly, it does help us because what it means is that we understand the crisis that has fully emerged now. We understand the roots of the climate crisis. We understand what it will take to move to a post-carbon, post-fossil fuel, post-nuclear economy. We've been working at this for 40 years. We understand what the corporation is. We understand its history. We understand why having corporations dominate public institutions is not just a bad idea. It makes it impossible to implement policy solutions that otherwise uh, the American people would vote for, right, and would implement. We understand that the corporation itself is the enemy of nature. Uh, at its heart. It is, uh, it is the accumulation of nature that has been killed and had value extracted from it and then used to extract more life from the planet, right? The corporation, the modern capitalist corporation is the enemy of nature. We understand that implicitly. We understand that you can have a system of international security that is based on peace and cooperation truthfully <laughs> Uh, not just in name. And understanding these things and having been looking down the road for many years and coming up with policy solutions and also analyses that help to explain the problems that we're dealing with is advantageous when you are a political party because when you go up there and speak, people listen to you and you sound like the least crazy person in the room. <laughs> now, there's a reason why they don't want the likes of Jill Stein and Sherry Honkala or any of us appearing in these debates because what we say makes sense. It may not have made sense. It didn't make sense to people 20 years ago. It didn't make sense. You know, they weren't, they had, we were saying corporations are taking over public education. <laughs> and you know, something made sense to some people, teachers, students could see some of it. But most people hadn't really, you know, 
been impacted by the crushing student debt load that is one of the products of the corporatization of higher education. Right? We could talk about the climate crisis, and certainly scientists have been in uh, great consensus on the, the scope of the problem, if not the specifics, for many years. But experientially, now, from New York to New Orleans and to the drought uh, punished regions of the center, central part of the country where I'm from, uh, people know that this crisis is real. It has real impacts on human beings, on certainly our local ecologies, and on our economies. So being right is advantageous as long as you keep at it. And we are entering that moment. We are entering the green moment right now. And the other political parties, the establishment parties, and other independent parties are not in a very good position to make the case at this moment. We are. So let's talk about how we make the most of it. And actually, if I could ask, if somebody could give me a time check at some point, maybe five minutes, Gloria or Michael in the back of the room, that would be good. I think we're running 10 minutes behind, so let me know. Thank you. At five minutes. Thank you. So there's lots of strategic approaches that we could take to um, building the Green Party in a moment that's opportune for us. Uh, but I'm going to suggest that there are really only two broad sets of approaches that are useful. Uh, and so I'm only going to talk about those. I'm not going to even knock down any straw men. Right? One of those is to be opportunistic. We, have, we are in a mo moment of opportunity. It's a long moment in the sense of human history, in the sense of world history. It's a blink of an eye. But we're entering into a period of probably 10 to 20 years that will be the green moment. And along the way, there will be opportunities. There will be many opportunities to reach out and to provide not only the explanation of why bad things are happening to good people, but what can and should and must be done about them. I'll give you a couple illustrations for how we've done this in recent years, or just one that comes to mind. In the course of the Stein campaign, uh, when Hurricane Sandy was bearing down on the Northeast, we were opportunistic. We had better be opportunistic. That was our job. And so we had a get out the vote effort and a message that was focused on um, Convincing people that unless they voted for Jill and for Sherry, for president, vice president, they were throwing their vote away. That they, they would not be counted if they voted for any of the other candidates. Nobody would see them. They would be invisible. And I think it's a compelling message, and we did deliver that message in different parts of the country. But overall, we shifted gears entirely. And in a 24-hour period, we came up with a television ad about uh, climate storms. That's what we call them. So the ad is called Climate Storm. If you Google it on YouTube, Climate Storm Jill Stein, you'll find it. And we ran that ad. And we ran it here, where many people couldn't see it. <laughs> and we ran it around the country. But that's what I'm talking about in terms of being opportunistic, you know, that we need to be able to pivot quickly and to be able to intervene as a political party in the things that are happening in people's lives. But our, you know, that's. That's important to say, and, and it's important to say simply that it, what it means is that you have to have the infrastructure and the know-how in order to be able to take advantage of those opportunities and the willingness and the thirst to do it. Okay, Point one. The other broad set of strategies have to do with something that folks on the left call moving from strength to strength. And in the better moments of the Green Party's history, this is exactly what we've done is that we look at what the next step is forward in terms of electing Greens to office, winning governing power, right? and we um, seek to secure those gains. Right? So what I'm talking about specifically is electing not one person here and one person there to local office, but electing a majority on a city council, electing a mayor, electing a school board. right? Um, securing communities that are actually governed by Greens so that other people can see what Greens do in government. Right? 
And over time, you develop strength in particular areas. And some of this is natural. There's, there's places that are just fertile for the Green Party, right? But you actually have to do the work of cultivating that, right? So there are places like Vermont, frankly, which is probably the most fertile state for the Green Party, <laughs> but where you don't have a very strong Green Party, right? So simply being um, ripe for the message is not enough. You have to do the work. But there are many other parts of the country, even you know, the Omaha, Nebraska's of the world, where there's a capacity for the Greens to grow. And, um, and overall, this strategy of moving from strength to strength means that we demonstrate our capacity to govern, what Greens do in government, to show people that when Greens have the presidency of the city council in Madison, Wisconsin, we pass some of the nation's first sick leave ordinances, which by the way we heard about from the green mayor of Santa Monica, California, who was the first to introduce the sick leave ordinance. And we passed the first municipal minimum wage ordinance to guarantee all workers, not just city employees and contractors, a living minimum wage in the city of Madison. And guess what? Other greens in other cities in Wisconsin and around the country then take note to show that we have the capacity to govern by balancing the books, right? To show that we are the true fiscal conservatives. Um, so we need to do that. Uh, we need to show that we have the capacity to win elections, not just the local elections, but increasingly higher level races. And we have come, we have come close enough to win in some cases, <laughs> in terms of state legislative races, but we've actually come uh, very close to winning in others. And we are very, in, in Massachusetts, in Wisconsin, in Maine, in California, there are certainly many districts, and I hazard to say in New York, where a Green can be elected to the state legislature. And the moment that that happens, people take note. And I can say that because there have only been a handful of Greens in legislative office in the history of this, of this country. But when we've had them, they're national figures. You know? when, or when you have a mayor, you know, and you have a mayor of New Paltz who goes to jail for performing uh, marriage ceremonies uh, for same-sex couples, you know, that becomes a national story. Those, those people become people that we can point to. So, we, we move from strength to strength in terms of showing the capacity to govern, to win elections, to change policy, right? As I was indicating earlier. Um, we develop the capacity to build more capacity, right? What, what do I mean by that? We develop the know-how about how to run elections. We develop the know-how about how to organize street demonstrations. We develop the funding base in order to be able to have a Green Party and Green Party candidates who are serious. Right? And who are heard about. I mean, in the course of Jill Stein for president this past election cycle, I was reminded time and time again that probably 95% of the American people do not know that there is a Green Party or even what it is. That sounds astonishing to us, not just because we're Greens, but a lot of us, we're, we're the poorest and the most well educated country, uh, party in the country, right? So we, we tend to be low income. Um, and we also tend to be uh, you know, highly educated. So we read a lot. <laughs> uh, and so you know, lots of people we know who are not Greens know about us, but the reality is most Americans don't know we're here because we have not gone to them and talked with them. So we have to have the capacity to do that. And in order to do that, you have to have the funding capacity and the volunteer capacity that needs to be organized and the infrastructure needs to be there so that we can do that. And then finally, we need to develop the capacity to reward. And this is something I'm still grappling with. Uh, having been in the Green Party for many years now, as I said in the beginning, uh, I have seen friends of mine who had a lot of promise uh, offered jobs uh, outside of independent politics. I've seen people who were elected as Greens to local office in different parts of the country who are now Democrats uh, serving in state legislatures and in two cases, in Congress. Okay. Um, they're good people. They are allies. My congressman is an ally. He was not a Green, but he was a member of another independent progressive party when he was a local elected official. He is definitely an ally, no question. Um, uh, but we didn't have anything to offer them. They, you know, they want to do things with their lives, and they showed that they could do things, right? We can't offer them uh, easy access to power, <laughs> no way. We can't offer them well-paying jobs, no. <laughs> you know, what do we have to offer? Well, let me suggest the first thing we have to offer is ourselves. And this is a very difficult thing for us to offer <laughs> because as Greens operating in an electoral arena which is designed to destroy us, 
and not just to destroy us, but to destroy any independent progressive political challenge. The laws we deal with today were written in the 1940s and 50s to destroy the Communist Party and the Socialist Party and the Progressive Party and to make it impossible for them to function. Okay? So we're in a hostile arena with a media that is controlled by the same people who control the major parties. Right? And we internalize a lot of the violence that's directed at us. Right? We, and we also internalize a lot of the victimization that happens. Uh, we are victimized, so then we self-victimize. Right? Saying that, uh, I want to recognize that we need to do the exact opposite. <laughs> we have to be confident. We have to be winners. We have to show people that we really do have the analysis and the answers and the ability to govern in a totally different way. And we have to be a place where people get to meet other cool people <laughs> who are inspiring. And we are that most of the time, right? But we have to work at that. That's really the only reward we can give people, is to be part of something that is rewarding in terms of the relationships that we build, the sense that we are going somewhere, and that we will win. We will win, by the way, there's, there's one very simple reason why we'll win. Margaret Thatcher was right. <laughs> she used to say, she was, she was half wrong and she was half right. She used to say that neoliberalism would win, capitalism would win because there is no alternative. Well, they did get rid of state socialism, true, and it collapsed on its own too. Uh, so there is no alternative. She said, Tina's on our side, so we're gonna win. Well, she was wrong about whose side Tina is on. Tina is on our side. There is no alternative to the Green Party and to green politics and to the solutions we offer. And the only question is how soon people learn that <laughs> and implement the policies, right? So I think we'll be more successful in getting there sooner if we develop the capacity to reward ourselves and each other for participating and doing the hard work. Think about where I want to end here. I'm going to skip a section that I would normally talk about which has to do with the history of independent politics in the United States. That's a nice little lecture in, a, in and of itself and our role in that. We do have a particular place. We're not out of time. I will just say this. When I say out of time, we're not out of, pl out of place, out of time. We're not just a party that was plopped down because some people looked at Germany and said, hey, that's cool, let's do that here. We actually have a lineage that goes back to the Revolutionary War and before of independent politics, of the Liberty Party born in this state in New York, right? which then went on to have its greatest success in a state named Wisconsin, and which then founded the radical Republican Party, actually the Republican Party before it was taken over, and then which passed on into the Progressive Party of fighting Bob La Follette. And there are people who voted for me when I ran for state assembly a couple years ago who had voted for fighting Bob La Follette in the 19, for his, his sons in the 1930s, right? And there are people, the people who founded the Greens in Wisconsin came out of that tradition. So I did go into a mini discourse on it. We, we do have an incredible uh, inheritance as Greens that is not only international but also very American. But what I want to just leave us with is this, a sense of the possibility. We do need to be thinking about where we're going five to ten years from now. Right? What are our goals? There's a strategic planning process that Karen and others have been working on, and many of you have been participating in nationally. Uh, but I just want to put out a few things for, for us to think about just today in the course of the campaign school. Is it not just possible, but likely that if we do our job right, that within five years, four to five major cities in the United States <coughs> could be run by Greens. And by run by Greens, I mean have majority city council that's green, or uh, mayors that are green. I firmly believe that's possible because I know Greens who've served in office in Minneapolis, and in Milwaukee, and in Boston, and in San Francisco, and those are all big cities. You know, coming from Wisconsin, they seem huge, right? <laughs> uh, you know, those are all big cities, and when we have four to five medium to major cities that are run by Greens, let me tell you, that is showing capacity. We can show the capacity to govern. We can show the capacity not just to govern locally, but to coordinate local action nationally. 
And that is something we have done some of and to some effect, for example, in opposing the Iraq war. It was green local elected officials that passed the first anti-war resolutions, and we coordinated that effort and it put local communities on record against the war first. It was green local elected officials that took on the Patriot Act first in a national way. And I could go on and on, minimum wage, sick leave policies. We have the ability to do that, and in five years we could be running four to five major uh, uh, or medium-sized cities. Within 10 years, there is the capacity for this party to have major party status. Right now we are a minor party as far as the Federal Election Commission is concerned. Um, that means that we actually have a national committee that they recognize, they regulate us, we're dealing with that right now uh, through an audit process, another story, but uh, not fun. Uh, but look, I mean, most of the country is governed by one party. Massachusetts is a one-party state. You know, Vermont is a one-party state. Progressive Party may say they're the second party, but <laughs> you know, I think there's still some room there in Vermont, right? California, Oregon, Illinois, these are all one-party states. And even within these states, there are regions of these states that are essentially one party. But where in that party does not operate uh, in a way that represents the majority of the population. Right? So those should be goals that we should be working towards, in my opinion. Um, we have the opportunity because this is the moment that we have been looking forward to, not necessarily with eagerness, but with a sense of determination. For Since the beginning of the Green Party, this party was built to address the crises that we are now facing. That gives us the opportunity to reach people who would not have been listening before. We have know-how that we didn't have 20 years ago. This party's matured a great deal as a political party since the 1990s. And all we have to do at this point is do the hard work and to remember to keep our eyes on the prize and to reward one another as we keep going forward. So I want to thank you for coming out, taking your Saturday today, doing the work, running for office.